want to thank you for joining us at Cross Creek Online, whether you're finding us on Sunday morning or later on in the week. Today, the first week of February, we begin our February series entitled Fear is a Liar. We're going to be in Genesis chapter th 3, primarily Luke chapter 8. But our theme verse deals with the source of fear, the source of all lies, and that is Satan himself. Jesus says this about him. He uses words like lust murderer. He says there is no truth found in him. And when he speaks, he speaks a lie. And Jesus says this himself, for he is a liar. And he uses the term father of it, meaning he's the first and he's the beginning of all of this. This month, we're going to look at some of the lies of Satan. Today, we're going to look at the lie attacking your self-worth. And so get your Bibles ready to Genesis chapter three and Luke chapter eight. As you do that, this reminds you that you can join us online at Facebook. You can also find us on our YouTube channel. We are with the Cross Creek Foundation doing something new for Valentine's Day. So we have a few weeks if you'd like to donate towards this. We're going to be helping out our third grade class in Pontiac Public Schools. And the teacher, I asked, what would you like? And she said, I need dry erase markers. She goes through a lot of them. And then she also wants to have these mathematic, particularly multiplication flashcards. Uh, she wants to send one home with each one of the kids. It's not a very expensive gift, but it will help them greatly. So if you'd like to participate in that, you can reach out to me directly, or you can go on our Facebook page and donate towards our PayPal account. Also for the month of February, if you'd like to help us out with the snacks that we do, uh, it helps uh, the kids out greatly as they have to go through their day. They have lunch at 1130, but they don't go home until four. And these snacks are a great source uh, for the kids so that they can keep learning. You really are making a difference in the life of many third graders in the city of Pontiac who, quite frankly, des desperately just need a leg up and need someone to care about them. So the, everyone who participates whether you come for the reading or whether you donate or whether you give certain products to help us out, just want to say thank you for it. So get your Bibles ready. And to this month we will be looking at fear is a liar and particularly that Satan is a liar. We're going to be in Genesis chapter three and Luke chapter eight. So get your Bibles ready and let's go. Satan is a liar. In one of his lies, he tries to make rituals, procedures, and denominations important. They may have their role, but they are truly not important. I'm reminded of a little joke. A kindergarten teacher was trying to teach her kids about world religions. So she said, next week, bring in an object of your faith and share it with the class during show and tell. So the next week, they all got up and shared little objects from their faith. One little boy got up and said, hi, my name is Benjamin. I'm Jewish. This is a star of David. This is very important to our faith. Another little girl got up. She said, hi, my name is Mary. I'm Catholic. This is a rosary. This is very important to our faith. When in the, near the end of the class, a little boy named Tommy, who was a troublemaker, he got up and said, hi, my name is Tommy. I'm a Baptist, and this is a casserole dish. Growing up as a Baptist, I found out that potlucks and casserole dish seem to be a very important part of our faith. But the tr simple truth is none of that, none of the, even the procedures, denominations, or constitutions are really what is important. This is a lie designed by Satan to get our focus off what really is important. If you're taking notes today, there's two things I think that are the utmost importance for us. First is Jesus. <clears throat> everything we do at Cross Creek is about Jesus. Our doctrine, everything we focus on, our teaching, everything we do focuses on Jesus. Even how we reach out through our foundation, it is all about Jesus. And the second part about that is people know Jesus as Savior. It's not just enough to know that Jesus was a historic figure or have positive thoughts about Jesus. We want everyone to know that they can be born again. In fact, Jesus said himself, you must be born again. <clears throat> you see, there is something or someone who's trying to distract us. I think he's even trying to get in my throat at this moment. But there's someone or something trying to distract us, and that is Satan. It is our theme verse in John 8, and 
Jesus says this directly to the Pharisees, but it's for anyone who doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior. He starts off by saying, you are of your father, the devil. Right there, we have a really a, a dagger in the heart of a common thought that most people have. And that thought is, well, we're all children of God. Jesus starts right there with the, the knowledge that there are two different families. There's a family of God and there's the family, well, the family of the devil. And if you want to be part of the family of God, you must be born again. But he uses words to describe Satan, and the words there are lust and murderer. He goes on to say, in him there is no truth. And when he opens up his mouth, he says, when he opens up his mouth, all he does is speak lies. And that's near the last part of that verse. And he says, for he is a liar and the father of all of it. You see, if you're taking notes today, our one simple truth is this. Satan is the author and confusion of lies. We see everything that's going on in our world, and there's so much confusion, and there's so much mistruth that is often said. No, it's not mistruth or alternate facts. It's just a simple lie. We are damaging children, and we are destroying their bodies at a young age. We are doing horrible things to each other, and sometimes in the name of God. But this is nothing more than a lie. It's a lie from Satan himself. He is the author of confusion. So when you see a family, when you see a church, a nation, even any organization in mixed of chaos and confusion, you can know this, that Jesus is not in control of it because Jesus is not the author of confusion. When I was a college student, we went to a Sunday night revival once and there was a speaker there, a pastor from Oklahoma by the name of uh, Dave McCracken, if I remember. And I remember he spoke on this subject and he used this same verse of John chapter 8. And he talked about how Satan is a liar. And I remember this Southern Baptist preacher getting really excited about Jesus and getting really angry about what Satan was doing. And he listed off some of the things that were going on in our world and everything, even back then. And it just seemed so horrible. And I remember him just with this passion that he had. He began shouting in his message and he just kept shouting, the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. And I remember watching him actually run down the side of the auditorium and run back up there. And he was shouting, the devil is a liar. As he went through and naming thing after thing that was going on. And it left an impression on me because Satan is a liar. But see, there's an opposite side of it. And the opposite side is Jesus. John 14, 6 says this, And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. As we start our series and our message today, I want you to understand this is not a choice I'm asking you to make. I'm not asking you to choose the right or the left path or anything like that. This is not a fable designed with a narrative to teach us sort of a lesson to keep us on a certain straight and narrow and that we'll be good to each other if we think there's a devil and there's a Jesus or anything else. I want you to understand that I believe Satan is real. He is a fallen angel who wanted the glory of God. He is the father of lies. He is a liar. And I believe it. I believe it simply because Jesus said it was so. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 3 and see the first lie that Satan tells. And it's to a woman. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, this isn't just the serpent, it is Satan. We're not going to pause here about the snake talking and different other things. We're just going to focus on what the word of God says for a moment. He said this, ye shall not surely die. For God knoweth that in that day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Some of the things Satan uses in his lies, well, first of all, he uses half-truths. He uses half-truths. Satan knows the Bible better than any preacher. In fact, he believes the Bible more than most even Baptist preachers do today. Physically, they do not die. But that is not what God meant when he warned Adam not to eat of it. Spiritually, though, they did die. As we looked at last month, everything is spiritual. From how you deal with people to your addictions to overeating to everything that is going on in your life, your relationships with your family. Everything is spiritual. And it is the spiritual death that is the final result of all of his lies. You see, even when Satan tempted Jesus, he had told Jesus partial truths. 
but a partial truth is a full lie. And Jesus only replied back with the Word of God. Secondly, number two, Satan uses self-esteem. He tells Eve what? He says this, he'll be just like a god. He plays on her self-esteem. This is a popular word today, but I would like to remind you that self-esteem is not biblical. The Bible warns against thinking too much of yourself. See, self-esteem is not biblical. In fact, it's not even good. But self-worth, self-worth is the beginning of a lot of healing that people need to understand. You see, self-worth determines what you think about yourself. Maybe you think too highly of yourself and you're not being accurate. Or maybe you're just having a bad day and you're down on yourself and you think too negatively about yourself than what you should. But self-worth, self-worth is what the most important person thinks about you. And what does, what does your self-worth today? Your self-worth is this, is that God loved you so much. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for you. You see, tomorrow your self-esteem may be very low. And even the next week, your self-esteem may be too unrealistic and too high. But who you are in Jesus Christ and how valuable you are to God and your worth will never change. Lastly, number three, Satan, he uses isolation. Notice how he waits until Eve is alone without Adam to go after her. Let's be honest, church, church is not e always the easiest place to be. The story goes on one Sunday morning, a, a mom looked for her son and he was not up for ready for church. So she went and down to his room and opened up the door and he was there underneath the covers. She said in a mom voice, young man, you need to get up. It's time to go to church. And her son from beyond the, behind the cover said, no, I'm not going, mom. I'm not going. And the mom said, you give me two reasons why you're not going to church, young man. And her son said, I don't like those people at that church, and those people at the church don't like me. The mom stood at the doorway and thought for a second and thought, well, those aren't two bad reasons. But she came up with two of her own. She said, I'll give you two reasons why you are going to church. Number one, you're 54 years old. And number two, you're the pastor of the church. Get up, get dressed, you're going to church. You see, Satan is going to try to isolate you. So you can go out on a lake and you can think about Jesus and sort of worship in nature in your own heart, but you will never truly honor Jesus with disobedience. Every believer has been called to be part of a local New Testament church, and you will never honor Jesus with disobedience. You need to be part of a group, a group of people who can encourage you, who at times can correct you, but you need a church. So the emotion that Satan uses the most, well, the emotion the devil uses is fear. Fear that you can't make it without another person, that one certain person, well, that's codependency. Fear that you can't make it without that drug or that alcohol, that's an addiction. And fear that you are never going to be loved and that no one would ever possibly love you, that's your self-worth and Jesus loves you. In Luke chapter 8, we meet a woman who needs Jesus, and it is fear that almost keeps her from coming to Christ. In verses 40 through 42, we meet a man by the name of Jairus. Jairus is a father with a 12-year-old, remember that, a 12-year-old girl who is dying at home. He is a wealthy ruler of the local synagogue. He is a very important person, and Jesus agrees to come to his house and heal his daughter. But on the way, this happens. First, end of verse 42 says this, But as he went, the people thronged him, meaning they just crowded him and rushed him. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, remember the 12 years? Which had spent all her living upon physicians, could, neither could be healed of any. Jairus and this daughter have very little in common on the surface. Jairus' daughter was 12 years old, and this woman had this issue of blood for 12 years. They had that in common. But because of this issue of blood, she was probably a hemophiliac, meant she kept bleeding and, she couldn't be, and it couldn't stop. Because of that, she was banned from the temple. You see, Jairus' daughter not only could go in the temple, but her dad would be kind of like the local pastor. I mean, she sort of had it at home also. 
This woman, the Bible says, spent everything she had on fraud doctors trying to heal herself, and she had nothing left. Jairus' daughter lived in a very wealthy home. You see, they had very little in common. One was young, one was old. But they had this in common. They had a need for Jesus. In verse 44, and came behind him and touched the border of his garment, probably just the loose strands. Some have speculated that it was Jesus' prayer shawl that she touched and held on to. And immediately her issue of blood stanched, the King James says. Another translation says immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Can't you see the fear in this woman? She's thinking, who am I to approach the master? J. Iris had no problem getting up into Jesus' face and talking to him one-on-one, -on -one, man to man, and asking Jesus to literally come to his house and heal his daughter. This woman is so afraid she doesn't want anyone to see her, and she just sort of reaches through the crowd, just sort of to touch the edge of Jesus' garment. You see, Satan will tell you you're not good enough. Satan will tell you that God's grace, well, God's grace could save everyone, but God's grace could never save you. You are not good enough, and no one will ever love you. But the truth is, the devil is a liar. You know, nothing has raised women up more than Jesus. And no one has been impacted by the lies of Satan from Eve to this woman to women today. As we kind of go across the globe and we look at cultures that are far from Jesus, go into a Muslim nation and see how they treat women like cattle. Oh, but come to a Western nation like ours that is getting more pagan every day and see how we treat women not as objects and, excuse me, not as people to be admired and protected and honored, but we treat them like objects, like sexual beings. That's, that's all they're good for. Jesus knows what happened, though, in verse 45. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, I mean, there's a lot of people here. The multitude throngly impressed thee. There's people touching you constantly. And thou sayest, uh, who touched me? Stop there just for a moment. Why aren't the disciples bringing her to Jesus? They don't even see her. I'd like to give you a challenge to look for the least of these. Look for the kid who's left out. Look for this teenager who sometimes turns out to be the school shooter. But look for the teenager who needs someone to love them. Look for the senior citizen who's all alone and might even be a shut-in, and it seems like no one comes by to check on her for weeks. You see, we as believers will give an account. We will give an account for what we have done. And the devil lies and says some people are more important than others, and that is a lie from the pit of hell itself. Now, the biggest fear the biggest fear is right here in verse 46. This is this woman's biggest fear. And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that there was not hid, she came trembling. The jig is up, she's thinking. She's literally shaking, falling down before him. She declared, by the way, Jairus never fell down. She declared unto him before all, all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. She begins to tell him, I've lost everything. I can't stop this bleeding. No doctor can help me. I touched you and I can see already the, the bleeding has stopped. Look at Jesus' compassion here. Look at the opposite. Satan uses women. Jesus lifts women up. And he said unto her, daughter, what a great term. Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. What saved her? What healed her? What made her whole? It was her faith. You see, salvation is by faith and faith alone. There's nothing you can do, no baptism, no church membership. There is nothing you can do. But here's the thing. Just believing about Jesus is not enough. The Bible says the demons and Satan himself believes. Satan knows everything there is about Jesus. He knows it. So just knowing is not enough. I'd like to illustrate what salvation really is. Imagine if you had a sickness, an illness, and you were terminal, and the doctor came into, your, your off, into his office, into your room, and said, you're going to die. There's nothing we can do, but I have a cure for you. Imagine it's just in a water bottle like this. It's just a simple liquid. And the doctor says, you will die, but this is the cure. And all you have to do is take this and drink it, drink all of it, and it will cure you of your illness. 
You see, you can, you can believe that this drink will cure you. You can believe that if you took it in, it'll immediately take care of you. In just a few hours, you'll be as good as new and you won't die. You can believe that all you want and you can know it in your head. But until you, with your heart, reach out, receive Jesus, as ask him to save you and come into your heart and forgive you and take him, it does you no good. See, unless you take the medicine, you're going to die knowing that the medicine could have killed you. And unless you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, you can know and believe everything about him. But until you in childlike faith call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to save you and you are born again, you'll never be healed. You see, the devil, he tries to create fear. He tries to create fear by making you see the wrong things. If you're taking notes today, you see what you're looking for. Uh, if you decide to buy a white car, and you start driving around throughout the week, you'll start to notice white cars everywhere. And the truth is, if you're looking for something wrong in your church, you will find it. And if you're looking for something wrong in you, oh, you know you'll find it. You see, the devil is a liar. And he's trying to get your eyes off the right thing, which is Jesus and trying to get you to see the wrong things. So from Luke chapter eight, what did everyone see? Well, the disciples only saw the crowd. They only saw the crowd. And you see, that's a big one in the church world today, just to see a crowd. Because in the church world, a crowd means money. The disciples never saw anyone as an individual. May I challenge you to fight against this? Look for the one. Look for the one kid who's on the outside. Look for the single mom who's alone and could use some help. Look for the person who's really unsure in church. Look for the one who just needs someone to love on them and hear the gospel. You see, the most important person, the most important person is the person who needs Jesus. Secondly, the woman only saw her imperfections. Specifically, she saw her own imperfections. Someone has told you someplace in your life, they told you everything that was wrong with you. I understand this. They said words to you like loser, ugly, failure. They said you were unlovable. But the devil is a liar. You are worthy to be loved. You are lovable. You may have imperfections. Yes, that might be true. But God loves you in spite of anything that could possibly be wrong with you. Jesus loves you. God sees you. When he sees you, he sees Jesus. When you know Christ is your personal savior, God doesn't see your sin and your mistakes and your issues. God sees Jesus because you are covered in the blood of the lamb. You may see your imperfections. Someone else may point them out to you. But today, God only sees Jesus if you know Christ as your savior. And lastly, number three, Jesus just saw the truth. He saw that there was a woman in need. Nobody else noticed her. Nobody else could spend time. And she didn't even think herself was worthy enough for the master to stop and to talk with her. Jesus saw the truth. In fact, he is the truth. Three things about truth. Truth is only found in Jesus. Look, it's easy to use an illustration of a politician about half truths and lies and everything. But without Jesus, there is no truth. Secondly, the truth will set you free. Facing what you've done, facing what has happened to you, facing what that person said to you, and stop running away with it from it. Stop trying to cope with it, whether it be from drugs or doing good things. Whatever it is, it is time for you to deal with it and shine the light of the truth of Jesus on it and see the way Jesus sees you and how Jesus responds to you and how Jesus forgives you. And lastly, truth is a disinfectant life. You spend time with Jesus even though you see all of your flaws and mistakes because he is light and truth. You also start to see how much he loves you. And even though some of us have screwed up better than others, he still forgives us. In 1555, Thomas Hawk, Thomas Hawks was burned at the stake. He was burned at the stake for being a believer and a follower in Jesus Christ. 
before he was burned that night in his jail cell, one of the other men that was going to be burned the next day for his faith in Jesus said, Thomas, I have to know. I have to know that if Jesus is good enough to get you through it, I have to know that you, if you can endure the flames, I have to know. Could you at some point, because I can see through my jail cell, could you at some point raise your hand up so that give me some sort of signal that Jesus is worth the pain? They took Thomas Hawk off. He told his friend he would do something. He would raise his hands up. Thomas Hawk was bound by his hands and he was set on fire in the midst of that stake. And as the fire began to burn his flesh away, it also burned the ropes that were confining his hands. And as his hands were literally melting away, Thomas Hawk, in the middle of the flame, raised his hands up and not just raised them, clapped his hands in three separate times. As his way to tell his friends that yes, it was a horrible thing he was going through, but Jesus was great enough to get him through it. It is time for you to deal with the truth. For you to deal with the truth that you've been hiding and not wanting to, to deal with and go back and, and begin to heal from. But it is also time for you to see the truth that the devil is a liar and the things that were said to you and the things that were done to you were a lie from the pit of hell, from the father of all lies. He is a murderer and he is the father of all lust. It was him behind all of it. And it is time for you to face what has happened. Because with Jesus, you can face the truth. Just like Thomas Hawk, you can raise your hands and say, I can get through this with Jesus. So I want to close today from a story from last summer. Last summer, I went to Brazil, particularly Rio, and uh, worked with a missionary, got a chance to preach there at some local churches, got a chance to help disciple some national pastors and love on them, and then got to do street evangelism. Great experience, got to lead uh, multiple people to Christ and talk with them about Jesus. But one day we were out in a group and we were going down a street. We were coming to the end of the street and it was their winter. It was very hot to me at 85 degrees, but they were cold. We came to this end of the street and at the end of the street, there was this brick wall and this brick wall was just separating the street from the the train tracks. And it was a very sketchy street already, but the end of it was even worse. We got to the end of the street and there by the brick wall, there were two very tough, looking bikers. As I, we were going down there, I thought, obviously, we're going to see them and turn around and go back, but we didn't. The missionary walked right up to them and began talking to them, and I thought to myself, we are going to die. Rio has a very high crime rate, and one of the things the missionary said, don't bring anything that you don't want, that if it was stolen, you wouldn't miss it. So the missionary is talking to them. Then he looked at me like he did with everybody else. And it was so easy when it was a, a teenager or an older lady or an older man or, or a person in my age group. It was easy to talk to them, but he did what he did with all of them. And he looked over at me and said, OK, Pastor Steve, you're up. I was sort of the go to evangelist of the day. And that was my job was to share Jesus and to pray with them to accept Christ. If that was the time I gave the missionary kind of a look like, are you insane? But I thought, well, if this is where I die, it's a good thing dying talking about Jesus. I went up and I had a little gospel cube and I went through the Romans row and I went through the whole gospel. As I finished it, the one guy I looked at and he just looked like he wanted to stab me. He had no, no desire to talk to me and he was looking at me with disgust. I could tell he was thinking, who is this American here and why does he have the audacity and can't he just leave us alone? And it probably wasn't such a big group we had. He might have stabbed me. But it was the other guy I noticed after him. And I noticed that he was crying. He began to tell a story. He knew Jesus. He was already saved. In fact, he said he was born again. But he had been far, far from God. And he was afraid to come back because he had been involved in what he just said, some very bad things. You know the irony there? I was afraid of him, and he was afraid to come back to Jesus. You see, fear almost kept me from going to talk to him. Fear is going to keep you from sharing Jesus with somebody this week, and it's going to pull you back. Let me ask you, who is trying to tell you? Is it the Holy Spirit trying to pull you back not to share your faith and to tell somebody that Jesus died for them? 
Or is it Satan trying to put that fear in you, keeping you from just simply telling somebody, I go to church, I know Christ is my personal savior. Have you ever thought about accepting Jesus? That's not that hard. John 3, 16, tell them that and go from there. And fear was keeping him from Jesus. You know, much like this woman with the blood issue, he thought that he couldn't come back. He thought he had done so much that God would never forgive him, that Jesus stopped loving him. You see, that was a lie. The devil is a liar. He's going to tell you not to share your faith and say people will laugh at you and be embarrassed by it, and you'll be embarrassed. The devil is a liar saying that you can never come back to Christ. He'll never forgive you. The devil is a liar when that person that said something to you, the last thing they said is they walked out the house. They said something so vile. They did something. They spit at you. They were so horrible to you. And there's those words that rang through your head that you can still hear in your heart today. Those were a lie from the pit of hell. The devil is a liar. Fear is a liar. Today, I want to encourage you, if you need to come back to God, if you need to deal with something in your life, don't let fear hold you back. Come back to Jesus. Deal with that issue. And if there's something that God is calling you to do, but you feel yourself being restrained, it's not God trying to hold you back. It's the father of all lies telling you you're not good enough. There's no way God could forgive you. There's no way God could use you. There's no way God's grace can cover your sins. The devil is a liar. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next week.